I appreciate the introduction, Quinn. Is the microphone fine? Everyone can hear. Uh, congratulations on the stamina. My gosh, three full programming. We're running, I think, about an hour late, and you guys are still there, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. So uh -huh. you, you must be the skeptics and the atheists of the humanists who did not stay up all night reveling under so, uh, thank you for that introduction. I, I want to, uh, even before I get into our chat, um, really thank Chris and Quinn and Ingrid and all the volunteers. I know how much work it takes to put on an event like this, and this is a completely volunteer-run conference, so please join me in thanking this crew. <laughs> As Quinn said, I am the president of the James Randi Educational Foundation, founded, of course, by James Randi some 16 years ago. I'm now in my third year as president of the foundation, and I've enjoyed these last few years immensely. Our mission is more limited than just to promote uh, all the sorts of values and ideas that we care about. We educate the public, and we aim to be a resource for the media with reliable information about pseudoscience and the paranormal, dangerous and unfounded supernatural belief. Our programs promote critical thinking and the scientific outlook uh, uh, in general, that's an aim, but really skepticism about what Randy calls woo-woo, the woo-woo beliefs in particular. Before I get into the discussion today about the relationship between atheism, humanism, and skepticism and what that means as we work to build a movement, uh, I just want to give a quick survey because I was pretty surprised and I uh, take this opportunity uh, regarding how many people are unfamiliar with, I think, the yeoman's work of the foundation. So we've started publishing books on skepticism for the general public, uh, bringing Randy's books out again, but this time for new audiences for the iPad, Kindle, and Nook digital publishing. We also do other important work, free regional workshops and trainings for grassroots groups throughout the United States and Canada. We do teachers' workshops, how to bring skepticism into their classroom. We make available skeptic smartphone apps, in addition to some audio and video podcasts. You may have heard of my show, For Good Reason. Before that, I did Point of Inquiry. Had a lot of fun with 200 plus interviews with really some of the leading minds of the day, debating and talking about some issues that we all care deeply about. We also support the wonderful show, Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. How many people listen to that? Okay, I, I think that was everyone in the audience, and if not, I'm, I'm, uh, I might not be a skeptic. Uh, we also do a, a lot of other digital outreach. So uh, I'm happy to say the JREF runs the 14th most subscribed YouTube channel, nonprofit YouTube channel in YouTube history. So if you haven't been to that channel on YouTube, check out our digital educational resources online. Or if you don't subscribe to our podcasts uh, or any of the other digital offerings. Of course, we put on the amazing meeting, the largest skeptical gathering in the world. We had nearly 1,700 paid registrants last year. And Tam Vegas has become really a four-day celebration of science and critical thinking. Now, uh, I'll draw some distinctions later in my talk, but I call it a skeptical gathering. It's not an atheist tent revival. It's not a humanist conference. It's an avowedly skeptic event, even though there's a whole lot of overlap, and we'll get into that. So a big event, and we're happy to attract some of the biggest leading lights, biggest names, celebrity spokespeople out there. Bill Nye spoke at our conference last year. Uh, we have a lot of great speakers, keynotes. It's really a who's who of the people we love talking our stuff. Neil deGrasse Ty Tyson was a keynote last year. Adam Savage has made many of our events from TV's Mythbusters. So what else? Uh, we at the JREF, really alone in this pantheon of organizations that care about these issues, uh, we like to go after, directly go after, the charlatans and the fraudsters. As an example, uh, the celebrity psychics. In the tradition of Randy's foundational work exposing uh, hucksters, we recently just featured, we were featured in a national primetime TV show, ABC's uh, primetime 
primetime nightline, for the first time in TV history, we tested psychics on national TV primetime uh, with our million dollar challenge I'll talk about in just a minute. 4.5 million people got to see this test of psychic claimants and it was breathtaking because in the follow-up interviews on the show, you had ardent, sincere psychics say, well, I thought I was going to win that challenge and I didn't. Maybe I don't have this ability after all. And that was like, that's breathtaking and that's something you don't often hear from that cult cultural competition. We recently focused on celebrity psychic medium uh, uh, the, the James Von Prague. He repulsively says he talks to the dead, uh, deceased loved ones of his clients. He wouldn't return our calls when we challenged him to prove his claims with our million dollar challenge, nor would he return the calls of the media who called him about it. So we did a little stunt to highlight his claims. Uh, we brought some dead people to his event, his live event, his spirit circle in Southern California. We brought some dead people, uh, or maybe <laughs> undead people. Uh, to his spirit circle, zombies, and this action against James Von Prague won media attention in Forbes, in the LA Times, <laughs> in dozens of other places. Our online video of this action, again, you can see it on our YouTube channel, has sort of gone viral. If you haven't seen this, check it out. You'll see, I think, some new approaches to talking to people who believe unlike us, as opposed to only ever talking to people who share our worldview. We've started coming out with free classroom resources that teach critical thinking in high schools and junior highs, uh, using the exploration of the paranormal to do so. So not just telling kids, here's how to think straight, but asking questions. Are psychic powers real? How can we decide? How can we figure that out? And helping students conduct an experiment in the classroom uh, to arrive at their own conclusions. I mentioned this ESP kit. Students learn how to accurately evaluate the significance of the results in their ESP test and how to guard against experiment or bias, against maybe intentional fraud, how to set up an experiment to keep them, themselves from being deceived or self-deceived. Uh, what I'm really excited about all of these um, modules is that they're attached to national science content standards and AAAS uh, national uh, uh, teaching standards. So these are resources I, I think are really valuable for teachers. We, we have another free uh, coming out and all of these are available for free online at randy.org. Any educator who wants them can download them. Be sure before you leave to come by the JREF table outside in the lobby uh, so you can see uh, hard copy versions of these resources. Lastly, I want to just quick re review our million dollar challenge. Obviously, offering a, mid a big money prize is not how science works, uh, per se, but we've sure found it in a really effective way to raise awareness both about people making paranormal claims and about uh, the public's responsibility to evaluate those claims, not be snookered by them. So I'm not here to do a long commercial about the JREF, nor just to represent the uh, James Rand Educational Foundation at the Free Thought Festival. I've been asked here to give a keynote in this section of the program focusing on movement building. And my goal in this talk is to tease out some not often discussed, but I think important distinctions uh, uh, and relationships between skepticism, atheism, and humanism, how these uh, three uh, movements or worldviews or mind views fit together, maybe in some ways how they don't, and how we can work together moving forward. Phil Ferguson asked earlier how many of us here are either atheist, humanist, skeptic, free thinkers. Everyone raised their hands. Uh, they, they all, I, I almost felt like I was a preacher because I, maybe I was misunderstood, but people started raising their hands. And did you ever see Creflo Dollar on TV? He's, he says, say amen, raise, raise your, how, how many, raise your, and everyone just does it like clockwork. Well, we all suffer from sort of a Mensa effect and we're, it ain't no such thing as skeptic foot soldiers. So uh, we don't always uh, march to uh, those orders, but uh, Phil asked how many people here are one of those categories, everybody raised their hands. I want to ask um, specifically, how many people would just consider yourself an atheist? How many people would just consider yourself a skeptic? How many people prefer the term secular humanist over the others? So, that's, so there's some more division there. 
I'm primarily a skeptic, although I use the term secular humanist when I talk about my values. I use the term atheist when I'm talking about my God belief. Uh, but you should know that in the skeptics movement, it's not homogeneous. Uh, homogeneous. 30% uh, of the folks who attend our big conference in Vegas, in fact, uh, each year, do not call themselves atheist or agnostic. Some skeptics who plug into the JREF come to our big conference and our other events. They use terms to self-identify like Christian or Jewish or Muslim, or they identify with Eastern religions. They're religious humanists. Uh, in our uh, midst. So the obvious point here, and that I'll want to be teasing out, is that skeptic does not mean atheist, does not mean humanist. As an aside, and this is not the top of my talk, but it, this is interesting data we uncovered as we were uh, looking at the uh, uh, responses, you might find it interesting that only 48.5% of the attendees of the last big event we had identify as progressive or liberal, 13.5% as moderate, 11%, 11.5% as libertarian, 2.5% as conservative. So uh, on our survey last year at TAM, we asked, uh, did anything happen at the event that made you feel uncomfortable? And we got three responses out of about 850 responses back uh, saying yes. One was a vegetarian vegan who was so, sort of poked fun at by someone. One was a, a man, an older man, who just didn't like all the magicians at the event, right? He was like, why are there so many magicians in skeptics events? I don't like magic. And, and the third, no kidding, was a conservative who felt like he was disrespected for his political point of view. So uh, there's diversity in this movement, both of the racial and sexual minority kind, but also of the ideological, if I can use that term, the ideological kind. Big question to frame my discussion is what would it mean if you consistently applied the spirit of science to your mo most central beliefs? Well, I'm going to stake a claim. It would mean that you're a skeptic. So even people who don't self-identify as skeptic, uh, they practice skepticism when they evaluate claims and only assent to those claims for which there's adequate evidence. You may also end up uh, identifying with these other categories, these other terms that I mentioned, but at a basic level, you'd be a skeptic. Bertrand Russell has this great line, I can't affect his high-pitched English accent, but uh, if you've ever seen him on YouTube or uh, in audio, uh, but he says, it's undesirable to believe a proposition true when there's no ground whatever for supposing it true. Well, that seems uncontroversial, but he goes on to say, this is a wildly paradoxical and even subversive idea because if you consistently apply the skepticism, it will necessarily overturn society's most fundamental and cherished beliefs. This, this is a big deal. This isn't trivial stuff. So the work of the James Randi Educational Foundation focuses on the paranormal and we have a lot to focus on. Three quarters of Americans believe in some or another aspect of the paranormal. Uh, the results of a poll conducted by uh, the Gallup organization a couple few years ago showed that three quarters of Americans buy this stuff. And this is ESP and haunted houses and ghosts. The survey data didn't even touch on God's existence, uh, but uh, the survey data suggests that on the left, you're more likely to believe in the paranormal. On the right, you're more likely to be, believe in traditional monotheism, and that's not hard and fast, but there are some suggestive trends. So 73% uh, of Americans believe in at least one of these categories. The survey data also uh, got into other questions like uh, demon possession uh, uh, or uh, like uh, uh, psychic powers, the power of the mind to heal the body, uh, things that flow into both New Age belief, but alternative medicine and uh, complementary medicine belief. So the skepticism I'm talking about challenges that, but not just because we want to be right, but because there are values issues connected to this. And that's uh, uh, what I'll get into in a bit. Properly understood, understood, skepticism is not just about scolding people regarding their nonsense beliefs but it's a, pro it's a positive and constructive method of inquiry. The form of skepticism that we push at the JREF is essential 
uh, to uh, sort of what, what we might think of as intellectual self-defense. It's not a weapon to bark other people over the heads with, but it's a way to protect ourselves from being snookered by hucksters and charlatans, undue uh, belief. And uh, it's talking about really important questions, not just uh, the oddball, quirky, hobby sort of things like another reason why Bigfoot doesn't exist, but real world relevant ideas. The skepticism, uh, and this is uh, really my uh, central point here, is foundational to our, all of our allied movements, uh, or at least it should be. Again, uh, I'm going to argue today that skepticism, as I'm talking about it now, should, at, at, at the very least, uh, uh, even if it's not, it should be foundational to all of our allied and sometimes overlapping movements and communities. Rationalists and atheists and agnostics and free thinkers, humanists, all of this should be grounded in the sort of robust skepticism I'm, I'm, that I'm talking about. Now, that doesn't mean all organizations, all local groups, all clubs, and every individual should do everything that skepticism touches. There's a necessary division of labor, or labor. Over the last 40 years of the organized atheist humanist skeptics movements, uh, there have been skeptic organizations that focus just on God. I would consider American atheists an advocacy organization, yes, but also a skeptic organization when it comes to God belief. It promotes skepticism of God belief and reasons not to buy into that uh, unwarranted claim. Uh, the Council for Secular Humanism, American Humanist Association, they promote skepticism about received morality and advance a different and alternative secular ethical point of view, but the project begins with a sort of skepticism about traditional monotheistic or uh, other religious moralities. This division of labor is useful as an organizing principle, but it's divisive when we get into our local camps and someone says, well, you should be, you should be focused exactly on what I'm focused on and vice versa. As I mentioned, atheism, uh, like American atheist pushes it, is just skepticism of one single unsupportable woo-woo claim. What's more, to know that I'm an atheist uh, tells you nothing about whatever else I am. Uh, I may be a libertarian who has some, maybe I'd say even faith claims or supernatural beliefs about the uh, unseen hand guiding the market. Uh, maybe that's a, uh, a supernatural claim. I, I don't know. Penn Gillette, I think, would argue. I may be a social democrat who's suspicious of corporations, or I may believe in central planning. I may. Uh, uh, buy into a Northern Europe uh, sort of uh, planned economy, welfare state. I may even, as an atheist, believe in UFOs, uh, consider the UFO cults the Raelians. They're all atheists who believe in evolution, but they believe in aliens and, the, and this notion that aliens came here and sort of seeded us. Um, be sure you talk to Carrie Poppy, who I'm sort of putting on the hot seat. She recently joined the aliens. She's the co-host of Ono oh Ross and Carrie podcast. And she uh, uh, has a lot of success, can I say, infiltrating. You, you are a Mormon, right? And uh, so many other great faith traditions. So if, if you have an interest in joining a cult, talk to her first. <laughs> and I should say something that I think is pretty obvious. Even if a lot of atheists at first seem to disagree, atheism doesn't imply thoroughgoing skepticism about anything else. It doesn't, as I mentioned, reveal anything about my other beliefs. Indeed, I would go so far as to say atheism is not enough. It's insufficient. It's, it falls short. Consider Bill Maher, whom we know as some sort of atheist or agnostic, uh, one of our best public spokespeople when it comes to uh, kind of presenting the case for why religion uh, is bull. He's certainly no skeptic when it comes to complementary and alternative medicine claims. Or think of the great atheist comedian Joe Rogan. I love him. I almost fell out of my chair in LA seeing him live once. Uh, uh, great atheist comedian, but he's certainly no skeptic when it comes to conspiracy theories like the moon landing hoax or other things. Uh, uh, so there are uh, prominent atheists that I talk to on a regular basis who buy into various 9-11 truther claims. Uh, 
or who believe in globalist conspiracy theories, or who are anti-vaxxers, no kidding, there are atheists who are anti-vaxxers, or global warming deniers, there are a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say a lot, but there's a measurable minority of folks who identify with atheism or even skepticism who are denialists when it comes to global warming. So being an atheist doesn't mean you're necessarily a good skeptic about other nonsense beliefs. Now, I've been to humanist meetings, and I, I sort of feel really at home in humanist meetings because I really identify with the ethics uh, that humanism advances. Uh, I've been to humanist meetings where everyone's on the same page about uh, you know, fighting the religious right, say, or about another reason at once God doesn't exist and that morality is bunk, but here's a better morality. But then uh, over cocktails or dinner, there's discussion about chakras or the new age or Eastern religion. Uh, so just because you're a humanist doesn't mean uh, you're necessarily a good skeptic. In fact, no exaggeration. Yesterday, at this very free thought festival, a chap came up to our JREF table and talked our ear off about, of course, there's no God, another good reason God doesn't exist. But that said, uh, there's a lot of evidence, after all, that ESP is real, at least uh, uh, psychic energy. Now, those TV psychics, they're probably frauds, but it's, there's, there are so many studies that show that psychic energy is real. And our research fellow, Kyle Hill, who was at the table, uh, and I just enjoyed that, that conversation uh, uh, for quite some time. <laughs> <laughs> and little did he know he'd show up in uh, my talk. I'm not sure if he's here today. It, uh, if he is and he raises his hand, everyone look at him <laughs> yeah, uh, for the fun. But no, he's a, he's a nice chap. So if atheism is just skepticism when it comes to one supernatural belief, humanism is just applying skepticism to receive morality. As I was saying a minute ago, not all atheists are skeptics, not all atheists are humanists, and vice versa. So we ought to complain, conflate. So I would, maybe these are fighting words, but I would say humanism also is not enough. If you're just talking the morality, but you're not applying skepticism, that falls short. If you're just talking about another reason why God doesn't exist, or you get together in assembly lines at your uh, local meetup and X out in God we trust on your dollar bills, that seems to fall short. That seems not to uh, be enough for me. A lot of new age movement uh, uh, is, uh, they might be skeptical of traditional religion, be allies in that regard, but not skeptical enough for me. So this is why we have to try to avoid making all these categories mean the same thing. The past couple years especially, the growing blogosphere, there have been a, a lot of arguments how we should you know, stop talking about the differences between these allied movements and, and just sort of ignore the differences, work together toward a common end. I believe the latter part of that. We do have to work toward a common end, but we ignore these differences at our peril. As an organizer who wants our collective influence and impact to increase, and for the destructive power of both religion and uh, belief in the paranormal and pseudoscience to be diminished in our society, I think it's important to form alliances and coalitions working toward common ends, but without brushing aside these important differences. So uh, that's why we push skepticism. And it's way more than you think it is. It's not just doubting someone's nonsense claim. It's not just saying no to another person's belief. Even folks connected with the atheist, humanist, and skeptics movement often seem to have sort of a muddled view of what skepticism is exactly. A lot of people think that skepticism is just a knee-jerk rejection to a claim, saying no to that nonsense, uh, telling that person another, another reason why she is wrong. What's even worse, people in our tribe here often conflate skepticism with being a cynic, assuming that skeptics uh, are sort of rightfully just a bunch of curmudgeonly sourpusses who have had enough of all the nonsense, we're a besieged minority, we get together, sort of lick our wounds about all the silly stuff they believe out there, and uh, that, that's sort of uh, an organizing principle for some of us, including uh, uh, myself. Uh, you know, sometimes it feels good to get together and fetch about another reason why we're the right ones and they're the wrong ones. Um, uh, it, as an organizing principle, though, it uh, presents certain challenges. It's not skepticism. 
The skepticism we advocate at the JREF is open-minded. It doesn't reject claims out of hand. I'd argue it's very healthy. It's living with an attitude of trial and error. It's being willing to change your mind. Uh, not all skeptics are. In fact, some skeptics, some atheists, some even humanists sort of uh, brandish this uh, thus saith mentality. They have a position and they, they wage war against their cultural competitors rather than considering alternatives. Cynicism is the opposite. It's a way of sort of being weary about the world, being tired of all the nonsense. Uh, it's refusing to accept any claim. It's a view that doesn't allow for the possibility that that psychic, the next psychic who applies for the million dollar challenge could be real. And at the JREF, uh, uh, maybe we're just talking ourselves into believing this, but I honestly think we're open-minded about these claims and I would love nothing more than for someone to apply for the million dollar challenge and win it. Because not only would we all get a Nobel Prize, uh, but it would change science as we know it. It would be a new discovery. It would be a big deal. And so we're open-minded about these sorts of claims. And every new claim, we have to allow for the possibility, even remote, that there's something to it. To reject it out of hand is not skepticism. It's not in the spirit of science. It's uh, sort of a, a sourpuss, uh, uh, curmudgeonly uh, cynical approach. So uh, skepticism, it might be helpful to think of it looking at its root. It just means to consider something carefully. It doesn't mean to doubt initially. It just means to consider the argument. On a very basic level, it's little more than ordinary common sense. Now, we could do that skeptic debate about how common sense isn't very common nor sensical, but uh, you know, if, you, if you're going to buy a car, you're going to lift the hood, you're going to kick the tires. That is an act of skepticism. So if you're going to be skeptical about buying a car, why not be skeptical before you buy someone else's ideas? That's the skepticism we're pushing at. Some people really smart at this sort of skepticism. It strikes them as a little cocky. How arrogant the charge is uh, to have such a high bar before you believe something that leads to a diminished life and you're just not happy and you don't connect with people and you're just naysaying all the time. I'll argue that it's not arrogant, though, and indeed, I'll argue that it's the opposite of arrogant. It actually contains an element of humility, an acknowledgement that the world is not always how it looks like it is, that we're easily deceived, that we're fallible creatures, or as Andrean, widow of Carl Sagan, says, skepticism is forever whispering in your ears, you're very new at this. You may be mistaken. You've been wrong before. And that really sums up skepticism to me. Now quickly I want to just address a recent conversation in our uh, uh, little movement by talking about what isn't skepticism. Skepticism is not only focused on things that go bump in the night. Uh, it's true that it, as an educational nonprofit, the JREF focuses on pseudoscience and the paranormal. I believe that nonprofits are best when they have limited missions, don't try to do everything. As president of the JREF, it's important to me to keep the JREF's mission uh, focused on uh, what we're good at, our expertise. We have a lot of magicians and scientists connected with us who can help us evaluate these sorts of claims. American Atheists does not test psychics. Uh, American Humanist Association does not issue press releases against a medium on national TV purporting to talk to dead people. So we have a limited mission. Uh, the other organizations have limited missions, and I think that's a good thing. That's why we're all necessary. It, it also, uh, skepticism does not mean it's doubting all knowledge. It's not this sort of postmodernist uh, uh, robust skepticism that uh, doubts any sort of claim, uh, what you might call epistemological nihilism, that you can't know truth, that everything's just a story, that science is just one mythic narrative of, among, among many others. This is not what I mean by skepticism. And probably most importantly, skepticism is not dogmatic. There ain't no such thing as a skeptic's statement of non-beliefs. Uh, the conclusion uh, that skeptics come to uh, about various claims is always subject to revision and examination, and skepticism is most, most valuable when it's applied not only to other people's beliefs, but to our own. 
So in other words, there's no one true skepticism. Uh, there's no purity test for a skeptic. Skepticism is a method, not a doctrine. Now I want to finish up uh, before we take some questions with some points about how to put all this together as we talk about the future of our allied movements. I talked earlier about how important it is, I think, to avoid conflating atheism, skepticism, and humanism. Equally important it is uh, to me to realize that not only are these different viewpoints, but that these allied movements overlapping at some uh, points have sometimes different agendas. So the first point to think uh, about uh, using this understanding of the natural relationship between atheism, skepticism, and humanism is that we should avoid jo joining up with other people generally of the larger rationalist movement and telling them that they should stop doing what they're doing and instead do what we're doing. So uh, don't join the skeptics in the pub and tell all of them they should instead you know, be fighting the religious right. Don't join the local atheist meetup and tell them what they really should care about is vaccinations and forget all this God stuff because it's trivial. Uh, let people sort of flower their own activism, provide resources to help uh, them succeed as, as, they, uh, as they value uh, their priorities. I marvel at the enthusiastic folks in our movement who are always doing this sort of stuff. It makes me think of that old joke in activism. This isn't really a joke, it's sort of argument by analogy. There's no punchline. But uh, the environmentalist who joins PETA, not because he cares about the ethical treatment of animals, but because he cares about the methane resulting from factory farming and that, how that leads to global warming. So he joins PETA and he tells all the PETA activists, you should stop worrying about uh, uh, those, those and you know, you should stop worrying about the puppy mills. Stop worrying about uh, the animal testing in labs. That doesn't matter because it's not impacting pollution. The only issue you PETA folks should care about is factory farming. Well, as I said, there's no punchline there. But uh, by analogy, I think that happens all too frequently in our stuff. You have atheists who go to the humanists and say, stop talking all the ethics. What we really need to do is fight the religious right. And you have, uh, even within skepticism, and this is spectacular, you have skeptics say, you know, what we really care about is Bigfoot. Well, what we really care about is UFOs. And then it's, it's like a skeptic <laughs> off or something. <laughs> Another bit of advice uh, as we think about movement building, we need to more ardently engage our cultural competitors, I think. We need to talk more to the wider world, to people who believe unlike us, try to be less insular, only ever spending our energy on internal squabbles. This is not endemic to the skeptic, humanist, atheist, rationalist movement only. This happens in a lot of progressive movements. It, interestingly, it happens less so in the conservative right, and that's because they have advantages we don't. They uh, have something called the leader principle. Ralph Reed can issue marching orders even when he's not a Christian coalition anymore. Uh, 2004, he uh, started a, uh, a Christian political consulting firm, sold his services to Enron, you remember Enron way back before they imploded, and he said, for $400,000, I will mobilize my base to advocate for, what, spreading the gospel, saving souls? No, energy deregulation. Because he knew he had a base of people he could push a button and they would call opinion makers and write letters to the editor. We don't have anything like that. Um, as, a, as an organizing principle, we don't really have a whole well-organized top-down uh, uh, grassroots uh, uh, sort of activism that way. And I think that's to our benefit. It speaks to our values. Uh, but when you look at our cultural competition, uh, folks on the religious and uh, economic right in the 70s looked around and said, my God, the liberals won gay lib and women's lib, and we got to do something about that. So they got together in what I imagine is a smoke-filled room, and in 1973, people like Tim LaHaye, the author of that single best-selling series in publishing history, left behind. Other people 
founded the Heritage Foundation. The Cato Institute was founded, Intercollegiate Studies Institute a generation before, and they have built institutions to organize their, can I say, unthinking base who just take marching orders. Well, uh, and they, they really take care not to fight amongst themselves. Reagan's one rule, um, the 11th commandment was it, uh, thou shalt not disparage a fellow Republican. Well, we excel, in fact, sort of take pride. Oh, we're skeptics, so we will criticize our own. I think that's important, but if that's all we do, we're not engaging in our cultural competition. I think we as a larger movement should more eagerly insist on making sure skepticism is primary. This means keeping ideology, to the extent this is humanly possible, out of the movements. So uh, local meetup group, uh, maybe there's discussion of politics, but if all it ever is is who's right, Hayek or Keynes, who's right, libertarians or, or liberals, uh, then you're not doing skepticism, you're not doing atheist activism, you're not doing uh, humanism. Uh, so, there are examples today regarding other important social issues, not just the economic stuff, but as long as we maintain a focus on skepticism, whether we're self-identified atheists, agnostics, humanists, we won't get sidetracked on other important but peripheral issues. As a movement building strategy, I think we need to focus on the positive aspects of skepticism, whether that's skepticism of God or ghosts, and whether we're talking about atheism or alt-med, Skepticism has a great sales pitch. It has a winning sales pitch precisely because what you get by being a skeptic. When we describe skepticism to the youngsters we work with at Camp Inquiry or uh, uh, other uh, venues where we work with kids, we talk about skepticism as a sort of intellectual karate, intellectual self-defense. Uh, I mean, you see Karate Kid, right? You think of karate as something maybe you're going to fight with someone else about, but it's actually a way to protect yourself. Skepticism is that. It's a way to guard you and yours from those who would prey on you and yours. <clears throat> when we highlight the most egregious charlatans in the media, the psychic mediums, uh, the faith healers, as Randy exposed Peter Popoff on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, a couple decades ago. We do so precisely because people um, get harmed by that undue credulity. And if you apply skepticism, you're not going to be scammed out of your money, you're not going to be manipulated in the most repulsive ways like the psychics and faith healers do. Lastly, as, uh, or second to last, another sort of important organizing principle as we talk about movement building. I agree with James Croft earlier when he talked about uh, speaking the language of morality, the values, the moral values questions. We need to emphasize the moral issues surrounding unfounded belief. This means talking about the harm that results from undue credulity. Movements are inspired by moral commitments, sometimes even by moral outrage, a desire to make the world a better place. If our organizing principle is only to be among the fit though few who are right on the issue of God or ghosts, uh, we're always going to stay a sort of fledgling movement. But when we frame, maybe I shouldn't use that term, but when we uh, present our arguments uh, in the language of right and wrong, and not just true and untrue or uh, uh, true and false, um, I think you can engage both people who are on, uh, on our side of the fence epistemologically but otherwise might not care, and our cultural competitors more effectively at the same time. When it comes to pseudoscientific quack medicine, or so-called complementary and alternative medicine theories, if you believe the pseudoscientific claims that vaccines cause autism, you will be harmed. And in a, if enough people believe those, we all will be harmed. Uh, if you believe in dowsing rods, seems sort of like a trivial belief, something maybe your great uncle does in the woods, you know, water witching or something. But if you believe in those theories and you use dowsing rods at bomb checkpoints in Iraq, which the US government did when they bought millions of dollars of a dowsing rod called ADE-561 that it took Randy, a magician, to expose not only the malfeasance, the taxpayer waste, 
but the brute fact that government officials were using a dowsing rod to find bombs, it, it, nothing actually in the gizmo, well, if you believe that unfounded claim, people will die. Now, uh, a competitor of that uh, dowsing rod, that was called ADE-561, is used at checkpoints in Mexico to find drugs. So people are being, their cars are being searched <laughs> through the use of a dowsing rod. It raises interesting uh, civil rights. So if you believe the nonsense, harm results. And talking about that, framing it in, in these ethical ways, I think inspires moral commitments, uh, unlike just uh, patting ourselves on the back and t talking about how great it is that we're right and everybody else is wrong. That's not going to inspire movement building as effectively. And this connects to my last point as we explore some movement building strategies. And that is simply, in our skepticism, be relevant. There are issues that skepticism impacts that are relevant to publics not often reached in the history of our organized movements. Peter Popoff, as an example, the TV preacher that Randy exposed on The Tonight Show for having a hidden earpiece in his ear with his wife backstage feeding him information about his congregants he was faith healing. In the, in the most vulgar terms, you really have to find this on our YouTube channel and see the clips where, where Carson actually had to stop the show. Randy recounts this because Carson cursed. He was so incensed uh, when, when Carson saw this. Well, Randy and everyone was pretty optimistic that this expose put Popoff out of business. And in fact, within that year, Popoff filed bankruptcy. But Popoff is back now. Uh, more successful than ever, making uh, more than twice what he made when Randy exposed him on The Tonight Show annually. And who does he prey on? And I'll use that term, prey on. He no longer does faith healing as much. He now does supernatural debt relief, <laughs> where uh, if you send him a love offering, which he actually advises, it's okay if you even max out your credit card to do this, because God will provide, this is a faith offering, uh, he sends you holy oil to sprinkle over your bills, a prayer, and it's supposed to take care of your, it's sort of like supernatural bankruptcy, and it's bankrupt in more ways than one. Well, who does he prey on? He primarily broadcasts his show on BET, and he primarily uh, goes after uh, poor black folks, because that's his target market. So skepticism is relevant to the black community in ways many of us don't think about. The GLBT community, uh, uh, or the GLBTQA, or I, I, I saw a nine letter acronym recently, I can't remember it. Um, as a gay man, I'm very aware how prevalent uh, quack medicine theories are in the gay community. So the JREF is going to have a booth this next year at LA Pride where we talk to gay folks about scientific medicine contra all the quack AIDS cures. That's a directly relevant application of skepticism to a gay community that normally really doesn't get uh, the story. Or well, the pseudoscientific ex-gay movement the skeptic community has paid far too little attention to that. That is junk science that is peddled as real science, and it's caused incredible pain and suffering to uh, a generation and a half of uh, gay people. I was in, when I was an evangelical Christian, uh, I came out gay when I was 14, I became a magician when I was 14, and I joined a cult when I was 14, so it's an eventful year. Um, <laughs> But uh, since I joined the cult, I was very serious about religion, lots of prayers with weeping and, and uh, earnestness. And I joined a version of Exodus International. I know firsthand how really messed up this junk science is, and we as a community address it far too little. So th that's an example. Um, so skepticism is more than you think. It should be foundational to everything all of us do, even if you're one issue is talking about another reason why God or ghosts don't exist. Make sure it's grounded in skepticism and not ideology. 
Uh, and because of events like this and the great presentations we've had all weekend and the conversation we've had with all of you, I can only be optimistic about the future when we talk uh, about uh, building this movement. So thank you very much.